Hello and welcome back to the Darth Magog channel. I'm your host, the Dark Lord of the Apostates, Darth Magog. And I have to admit, I was a little harsh in my last editorial video. During a video titled, 10 Weird Rules That Jehovah's Witnesses Must Follow, I made a statement. A very, very specific statement that, surprisingly, didn't upset many people, but did get them asking questions in the comment section. I read all the time that people have a Jehovah's Witness friend, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but no you don't. Well, you have a Jehovah's Witness friend, but your Jehovah's Witness friend doesn't have a worldly friend. But, as with all things, even if Jehovah's Witnesses want to pretend that it's not, not everything is black and white. So today, we explore the gray, presenting your guide to the Jehovah's Witness moderate. We would be honored if you would join us. Let's start off small. We'll be defining a couple of terms and phrases that will be essential to today's topic. Those terms are bad association and good association. If you're a former Jehovah's Witness, the term bad association will probably still make your stomach drop. But for non-Jehovah's Witnesses, I'll give you the basic version. You're probably familiar with the phrase, a bad apple spoils the bunch. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses, as they do with everything, take this concept to the next level. Bad association is, in short, anyone who doesn't meet Jehovah's Witness standards. The 1971 Awake article titled, Bad Association Spoil Useful Habits, outlines behaviors like stealing, drug use, and premarital intimacy. It also decries friendships with anyone who identifies with the LGBTQ community. So, functionally, anyone who practices, quote, bad things, as quoted in the Watchtower article, Watcher Associations, in these last days. The same article also mentions that even fellow Jehovah's Witnesses who participate in these so-called bad behaviors would be included. Editing Magog here, just a quick aside. When I say so-called bad behavior, I'm not using that to excuse anyone who participates in loss and or homicide as described in these paragraphs. I'm really talking about other things that Jehovah's Witnesses find improper, like going to college or toasting a drink or having a consenting intimate relationship with an age-appropriate adult who isn't one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and a ton of other things I've discussed at length in the past. I'll post a video or two you can reference here, but that's what I meant there specifically. People that abuse their spouses, prey on innocent children, and steal the livelihood from others are indeed very bad people. No argument there. Now, on with the video. Conversely, good association is, well, the exact opposite. Returning to the article Watcher Associations in the August 2015 Watchtower, their best definition of good association is, quote, Associating with those who love Jehovah can help us to imagine what life will be like in the new world. The 19th paragraph does go on to say that Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't associate with anyone who doesn't love Jehovah, when there are millions of fellow Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide who are available choices for companionship, whether it be platonic or romantic. But Lord Magog, you may say, I swear to you that my best friend is, or was, one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and they've never bothered me about it, stressed me about it, or looked down on me, and that's probably because they fell into one of six categories. Let's go through them all. Now that's a true friend. So your first, more moderate Jehovah's Witness, and what I feel is the most common, would be the child of one of Jehovah's Witnesses. There are little witnesses born into the organization, or sometimes ones whose parents started when they were very young and may as well have been born in. They're common at your average public school. These kids are the ones who don't celebrate birthdays, participate in holiday parties, don't join the band, or the basketball team, or anything else enriching. They live, often by parental force, the lifestyle of a Jehovah's Witness. But these children may like you, and actually get along with you pretty well because they haven't quite fully developed a fear or hatred of so-called worldly people quite yet. Fun fact, most children of Jehovah's Witnesses aren't actually Jehovah's Witnesses themselves, even though they may live as one. From a purely technical perspective, unless you're a baptized active member of a Jehovah's Witness congregation, you're not considered a Jehovah's Witness by Watchtower themselves. They even make this distinction for unbaptized publishers. 
That, however, doesn't stop Watchtower from using the field service time of unbaptized publishers in their reports, or accepting the monetary donations of Jehovah's Witness children, or telling children that they need to identify themselves as Jehovah's Witnesses at any opportunity. No thanks, I'm a Jehovah's Witness and I don't celebrate birthdays. So in this instance, you probably do have a JW friend at school who thinks highly of you and does want to go to your birthday party or your sleepover or your basketball game because they care about you. But they're not allowed to because of their parents' restrictive religion. They're probably the farthest on the scale on the merit that they literally have no choice, depending on how old they are, in being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now that's a true friend. This is also on the extreme end of the spectrum. Your second moderate Jehovah's Witness is going to be the PIMO JW. PIMO is an acronym for Physically and Mentally Out Jehovah's Witness. I say this a lot in the comments, but in short, this is a witness that's paying lip service. To expand on that, however, it can be a bit more complicated. Physically and mentally out witnesses are most often baptized Jehovah's Witnesses that are faithful by all appearance as in they go to the Kingdom Hall regularly, go out in field service regularly, study their watchtower, attend conventions, and practice all the tenets of the religion, but for some reason or another, don't believe in them. The doctrines and teachings vary. Some people take issue with the Jehovah's Witnesses' interpretation of scripture, others find inconsistency in teachings around grooming and dress. Personally, I found social considerations silly, like the invalidation of the LGBTQ community, or the absurd rules around dating and courtship in the religion. So, while outwardly a PIMO will uphold all JW theology, in private or anonymous circumstances, they'll question the religion. Which sounds a little silly to the outside observer, but once you factor in the social isolationism of the Jehovah's Witnesses and combine it with their disfellowshipping doctrine, it makes sense. We've already reviewed Bad Association on this video, and we've discussed disfellowshipping in the past, but for new viewers, I'll bring it back up. Disfellowshipping is a process in which a Jehovah's Witness is forcibly kicked out of the Christian congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses for committing serious sin without repentance. This can range from serious things like child or spousal abuse, but can also include things like questioning the doctrine or associating too closely with non-Jehovah's Witnesses. The results of this process include shunning, meaning that every and any Jehovah's Witness you know will, for all intents and purposes, pretend that you don't exist. Given the insular nature of your average Jehovah's Witness's life, PIMO Witnesses often persist in their charade to preserve family and community ties. This doesn't stop them from building new friendships and bonds, however, sometimes in hopes of having a proper social circle once they decide to leave the Watchtower on their own terms or if they're discovered before they're ready to leave. So yes, this one is also likely, legitimately, your Jehovah's Witness friend, albeit a bit more secretly on their side. Now that's a true friend. The next type of moderate witness you'll run into is the Pomi Witness. The opposite of Pimo in that Pomi is physically out, mentally in, meaning they don't attend Jehovah's Witness worship, functions, or participate in volunteer work, but they also believe in the theology, doctrine, and other aspects of the religion. Homey witnesses will be out for a number of reasons. Sometimes they can't keep up with the rigorous requirements of the religion and are seen as spiritually weak or otherwise non-committed to the Jehovah's Witness cause. Others have been disfellowshipped or are otherwise disassociated from the religion, but not by their own desires. In this apostate lord's opinion, I personally find it less likely that a Pomi witness is going to be your friend, or if they are, probably not a very close one. They interact with the world around them generally because they're not welcome amongst other Jehovah's Witnesses. And given that most of them still believe in the concepts of good and bad association, you're more likely a means to an end, but since there's no official Jehovah's Witness study articles on this, or any reputable psychological profiles on known POMI witnesses, you'll have to take this assessment with a grain of salt and make your own decision. Now that's a true friend. Getting into more questionable territory here, but number four is our Jehovah's Witness co-workers. 
Jehovah's Witnesses, as you likely know, are expected to be friendly to the world as a whole, in order to give what they call a good witness. The purpose of a good witness is to show that Jehovah's people are good people, and since the hive mind of Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to act the same, or as they put it, put on the new personality, what one witness does, they all do. Perhaps your witness coworker or even classmate likes to sit with you at lunch, occasionally offers sage advice, and takes a personal interest in your life. They share a few interests, and so on and so forth. You may even hang out with them outside of work from time to time. Not a bad deal. A word of caution about this witness friend. It's a distinct possibility that they may be reaching out and spending time with you in hopes of converting you. Jehovah's Witnesses are admonished in their religion to seek out what they determine are honest-hearted ones or people with positive personality traits and legitimate interest in the studies of Jehovah's Witnesses. In practice, that usually just comes down to a witness taking a liking to you and not wanting you specifically to die in Armageddon. So their goal is to convert you first so they can officially be your friend and count a few hours of Bible study on their field service card along the way. You'll know for sure if their behavior changes significantly, depending on how much interest you show in their offer of a free Bible study. But I've found this specific type of JW friend to be much more shallow than the others on offer. Now that's a true friend. Okay, I'm cheating a little with this one, but Kevin McFree already made fun of this, so I will too. Jehovah's Witnesses, despite their denial of splitting up families, tend to do that you'll probably see your JW family member in a few different ways. 1. They're doing their best to serve God in the best way they know how, and I'll support them no matter what. 2. They've changed a little and I don't see them as often, but I know I love them and they still love me. Or 3. Dear God, where did the watchtower take my family member? Give them back, you baggy suit-wearing monsters. Jehovah's Witnesses' doctrine of bad association applies to non-believing relatives and family members too, but because of the supposed focus on family, culturally Jehovah's Witnesses are a bit more lax about associating with actual relatives as a whole. So I firmly believe your JW relative loves you most certainly, and probably likes you too. Sadly, depending on how serious they are about the religion, that tends to fall short of their devotion to Jehovah and their new spiritual family. Jehovah's Witnesses mention in many of their study aids that family members may take issue with them studying the Bible. Ironically, this self-fulfilling prophecy is one of the few that the religion can quantifiably demonstrate is true. As your JW relative continues to put on the so-called new personality and takes on more JW traits, they'll abandon ideas, hobbies, and values that were previously very important to them. They may change their view on other family members, especially those who identify as gay or trans, to reflect their new Bible-based conscience. You won't see them much around the holidays, and never at a holiday event. Their birthday parties and birthday calls will stop and anything tangentially related to religion will ultimately lead back to how theirs is the correct one. Having a JW family member is a lot like having a JW co-worker in some regards, but to farther extremes. Because you're already related, there's no pretense and no HR to buffer your beliefs from them. They already have a personal interest in your life because they know you personally. It's just them, with their previous attachment to you, trying to get you to fall into their JW life, ideally as their spiritual brother or sister. So to be clear, I promise your JW family member still cares about you even as a non-believer, but depending on how deeply ingrained into the JW culture they are, your relationship with them won't ever be the same. Now that's a true friend. And here's the big one, the double lifer. Jehovah's Witnesses like to give talks about living what they call a double life. A double life, according to How Can I Stop Living a Double Life, is when a witness engages in conduct that goes against JW standards, mostly privately, but publicly professes to be a witness. While this can be related to being PIMO, often the activity is performed by physically and mentally in witnesses, or PIMIs as we call them. It's sort of a compartmentalizing or cognitive dissonance that allows them to have a life outside of the Kingdom Hall. 
like a secret identity of sorts, all the benefits of Jehovah without his restrictions. The reasoning for this varies from person to person, but it usually involves blending in and having a sense of independence or just wanting to take a break from the religion, which Jehovah's Witnesses strongly discourage. Personally, I've done this myself because I'm much more private with my religious beliefs, and growing up, I was very embarrassed by my JW beliefs. Some of them were downright unpalatable, nonsensical, and frankly, depressing. But I still firmly believed Armageddon was coming and paradise was just a night's sleep away. Again, partially from personal experience, I won't rule out that a JW friend like this is your friend, but I'd expect them to be a bit more fair weather if you catch my drift. You'll be invited, but only in private, if that makes sense. There are probably a few more types like the live and let live type of witness, or maybe the physically and mentally questioning skeptics of the Kingdom Hall, but those six major archetypes should cover your bases. So now that you know a bit more about your Jehovah's Witness friend, or lack thereof, the follow-up question remains, what should I do about it? And the short answer is, nothing special. The longer answer is a bit more complicated, and before we get into that, I need to define one more term, Christian unity. I talk a lot about the new personality hive mind of Jehovah's Witnesses, and Christian unity is the pinnacle of that particular cultural expectation. According to the September 2010 Watchtower article titled Christian Unity Glorifies God, Jehovah's Witnesses believe that there is only one body of true worshippers, said worshippers being Jehovah's Witnesses. And the same article emphasizes the importance of everyone behaving the same way, believing the same way, in unity. So they firmly believe that you can only gain God's blessing by matching the same zeal and spirit as fellow Jehovah's Witnesses, especially the promise of eternal life on a paradise earth. So any deviation of this perceived unity is seen as a problem internally. A Jehovah's Witness can't disagree or go against any tenets of the religion without facing consequences. Hence, these JW friends of yours are breaking the mold in a place where mold breaking isn't welcome. In contrast with the Christian congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, there's a little more you can do. 1. Don't put too much pressure on your Jehovah's Witness friend. Dr. Mark Banshik from Psychology Today has compared cults to abusive relationships. Strong, intelligent people can be sucked into them very easily under the right circumstances. 2. Keep your expectations low. There's a distinct possibility that any JW friend could get sucked deeper into the organization or be faced with an ultimatum, and even if they aren't, their privacy isn't well respected by the religion, and going too far outside of Jehovah's standards could become problematic for them in the long run. And finally, keep yourself available. You don't have to be ready for every word, but if they are able to escape the watchtower one way or another, Having a firm hand or open arms on the other side will mean the world to them. Pun intended. Okay, lecture is over, XJW agents. What do you think? Have I accurately assessed your Jehovah's Witness friend? Do you believe that the moderate Jehovah's Witness has a future? Or has your experience been radically different and I'm entirely wrong? Whatever your thoughts may be, I'd love to read them in the comments down below. And, as always, remember, the elders may be watching you, but Darth Magog is watching the Watchtower.